Hey guys, uh, time for some questions about France in 1940. I am actually ill, you can probably tell by my voice. So this week's video and next week's curling video will have the dreaded cold voice. Yay. Always happens, but what can you do? Anyway, let's get on with the questions today. Timestamps will be in the uh, video description. Howard has said, I downloaded the Rommel papers by Lyndall Hart. This is actually Rommel's MO. In 1940, when Rommel attacked through Dinant, his line of march was ridiculously narrow. Map on page 23 of Rommel papers. What really struck me was the depth of French incompetence. Rommel described trying to advance through a sea of French soldiers attempting to surrender. I tried to research the French perspective and watched a couple of videos on YouTube. The incident where General Maurice Gamelin met the generals, told them to proceed as they deemed fit, and then sat down to a large slice of cake is comic gold. It leads me to believe that Nazi Germany should never have done as well as it did in World War II. You seem to really dig down deep to get to the truth of a battle. I know you are committed to cover the Eastern Front, but I would like you to focus your considerable research skills on the whole fiasco that was the French military in 1940. This is related to what Mark asked. I was wondering if you could do a episode or series about the Battle of France. Many people still get that vision of coward French fleeing in front of the mighty German army. However, I think there are quite a few elements to clarify, like, for example, the fact that on paper, French and British forces were superior, or one of the first real tank battles of the war. I'm aware that you can't rewrite history and always look for excuses, but a few lights to sort out the truth from the myth would be welcomed. You're right, guys, that I've been focusing on the Eastern Front and the North African campaign, but I have done some research on this, I've, I've read a few books on it now, and yeah, well, it, it's hard to get away from the fact that at least two French divisions did in fact flee, um, let's put it that way. We have the 71st Infantry Division and the 55th Infantry Division at Sedan. Uh, the 55th Division fled first, and then the 71st saw this or heard of this and then decided to flee as well. So we have definitely at least two divisions at Sedan, 1940, which do flee. And yeah, you can't really get around this. What you can say though, is that it's no wonder that they fled and I don't blame them. And it, you can't also then say, well, those two divisions fled. So all 100 plus divisions of the French army were all useless or cowardly and that everything that France did is as a result of the morale crisis or so, I, I don't know. Some authors try and paint this. Um, I believe Horn tries to paint this as, you know, oh yes, it, the French were all cowards and blah, blah, blah. Well, not that, he doesn't go to that extent. He says there was moral de decay uh, within the Third Republic and as a result of this, the men weren't motivated to fight and thus the whole thing came apart. Well, I've not done too much reading, but I've done enough reading to go, that's not actually the case. So yes, it's true those two, two divisions did flee, but if you look into it, for starters, those divisions were B-series reservists. So you have basically active troops, then you've got A-series reserves and B-series reserves. So these two divisions happen to be the worst possible divisions, like the least trained, there was very little discipline, there's accounts of some of the leadership within the divisions going, the, this, these divisions are useless basically, um, why they were on the front line, why they happened to be the, you know, the, the divisions that were going up against the Panzer divisions, well, it's to, to do with the whole grand strategy, isn't it? Um, the whole operation and what the Allies' plan was. And essentially, you, you know, as I say, you can't really say, well, the, the B series reservists who had little training and motivation anyway and were poorly led are therefore representative of the whole of the French military, right? That, that's not, you can't do that. Uh, the French military is roughly 2.3 million strong. And these two divisions, what, a couple of, you know, 20,000, 30,000, whatever many troops are in it. You can't, you can't say that. So these, Arguments, oh yes, this represents the whole thing, or France was moral decay and all this other stuff. 
you can't paint it with a blank slate, which is what some of the authors are trying to do. And I don't really blame these two divisions for fleeing. When when you look at the situation, so Rundstedt and his army, um, army group, they actually have 43 divisions, most of which were, you know, elite, the best that the German off, uh, army can actually muster at this time. I think he has, well, I think the, the Germans in total have 16 motorized or panzer divisions, and the, a significant portion of these are in that area at Sedan. You've got Guderian's corps, you've got um, Reinhardt, who later became one of the army group commanders, and you've got somebody else as well, off the top of my head, I can't remember. And then you, you've got like Rommel, you've got uh, all the panzer commanders who are actually pretty decent, you know, later figures, you hear about them all, all in the same area, all firing, you know, aiming for Sedan in that area, and then off to the coast, and you've got just a handful of French divisions, four of which are cavalry, which isn't great, you know, cavalry against panzers, you no. Know. Uh, you've got four divisions of, of cavalry, and you've got, I think in total there's another, there was, I think there's nine of each, so there's going to be about 18 French divisions-ish in the area. The rest of the, you know, not counting the cavalry divisions, are all infantry divisions, and there's one or two um tank divisions that end up in the area, but they're not there at first. So basically you've got infantry and cavalry versus mobile German blitzkrieg uh, units. So straight away you've got a, a situation where the French are not only outnumbered by the 43 to 18 divisions, you've also got lower quality troops, reservists, and you've also got, you know, cavalry versus tanks. Again, not very good. You've got a Schwerpunkt, so it's all concentrated. They're all aiming for the same area where the French troops kind of spread out and not all in positions. They don't get to the positions in time. You also have a situation where there's no air support. So the French, I believe, let me just double check. Da -da -da -da. So the French, well, A, they don't have enough anti-aircraft guns. The Germans actually seem to have about two to three times as many anti-aircraft guns. Uh, the French don't have enough anti-aircraft guns to supply all their units. And then on top of that, the French have uh, 632 fighters. The Germans have 1,210, right? So double. <laughs> uh, in terms of bombers, the French have 262. The Germans, 1,680. Okay, so in total, the French can muster 1,286 fighters, uh, sorry, 1,286 planes. The Germans can muster 3,530 planes, and the British have 416 planes as well. So, yeah, we're, we're talking getting completely outnumbered in, in terms of the air. Most of the Allied aircraft are concentrated in the Belgium or the northern France area, so there's not enough in this sedan middle area, and as a result, they've got no support. So you actually have the 55th uh, Division, I, think, I believe one of the battalions, of, uh, the first one that routes, just gets hammered by Stuka attacks. Like just constantly gets hammered, the troops panic and flee, and then that begins the rot, which, you know, and everything starts collapsing. And it's like, right, they've not got enough anti-aircraft guns, they've got no air support. One of the Army commanders doesn't even call in air support, even though technically some were available. So he doesn't even bother to do that. It's just a disaster. Uh, so it's kind of like, yeah. Then when you actually dive into it, so the French, let me get this right. <clears throat> the French actually developed a very, very good anti-tank gun. It's a 47 millimeter anti-tank gun. However, by the time of mobilization, which was in 1939, they had 270. Not 270,000, 270, okay? So, not enough. Uh, they did have 1,000 of these by May of 1940, but not all of them had, de had been delivered. So there might have been 1,000, but not all of them had been delivered to the armies, and so the divisions weren't equipped. And do you think they're really going to prioritize the reserve units? No. So each division was meant to have been given 12, but there wasn't even enough to fulfill that, so the chances are they didn't get any... And then they did have a lot of older guns. They had the 25mm anti-tank gun, which was, which was designed in 1934, which could do 
Um, it could work. You can get it to work, but they were scarce as well, and obviously wouldn't do so well against like the Panzer IV, but against the light tanks you got a chance. And then it turns out that most French divisions were armed with the 37mm anti-tank gun, which was designed and built in the First World War. <laughs> right? So anti-tank guns of the First World War era were being used by the French. So no anti-aircraft guns, or very few. Very few anti-tank guns, and those that they did have were out were considerably out of date. Um, the, yeah, no air support. Reserve units. No wonder they fled, right? That that's that's kind of like the picture. It's like, oh yes, no wonder they fled. Um, so is that? Oh, it's moral rot or decay or whatever. No, it it's perfectly any other unit in that position would have fled. I think there's. I don't see how you could get around that. I think even if it was a superb up-to-date unit i mean yeah, they may may have stood their ground but they would have got slaughtered anyway so i can't you can't i don't think you can fault them or say that the whole of the french army can be you know um proven to be as bad as these units were these two divisions were just in the wrong place at the wrong time and in fact one of the authors i believe it's jackson actually says this as well they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time because the strategy that was developed was okay they built the maginot line uh, in order to prevent the Germans from moving in the south. So this gives the Germans, well, two opportunities. One, to go into Switzerland, which they decide not to do, which is probably a good idea because of the mountains. And the other one is to go into Belgium or through Belgium and Luxembourg and into northern France. Well, the idea at the beginning was a Schlieffen-like plan, which they'd used in the First World War, and then... And actually Hitler kind of went, yeah, this is okay. And actually said on the 10th of January, 1940, yep, yeah, let's do this. Let's start the campaign on the 12th of January. And then 10th of January, a plane crash lands. Well, I think it has an emergency landing in Belgium. And some of the papers got captured, including the plans for the entire German offensive. And so Hitler called it off after getting a bit annoyed. Uh, and so then this gives Manstein his opportunity to do his Manstein plan. But the Allies, even at this stage, thought, okay, what we're going to do is walk into Belgium. Belgium's got a whole thing where they didn't... They had an alliance, but then cancelled it. And so the Belgians were going at it alone. They didn't want to... Because they didn't know if the Germans would go through Belgium, although it did seem likely. So they weren't sure. They didn't want to at the start of war, so they kept the French and the British out of it, so they went alone, essentially, but the the British and the French were like, well, it's clear they can't go through the Maginot Line, so they're going to have to go through Belgium, so or Switzerland, so we'll send troops into Belgium, and possibly even uh, Holland, if we can get there in time. And that was the whole plan. It was like, well, we'll go north. So essentially, you've got this Maginot Line, the British and French, as soon as the, you know, the Germans invade Holland and Belgium, go, okay, let's walk into here, leaving the center of the battlefield in the Ardennes area, you know, with, with just a handful, 18 or whatever divisions. Well, clearly, that's a good area for the Germans to strike. It just so happens that that's where they wanted to strike. And yeah, I, I, I honestly think that it is a case of it's just a strategic error or a operational error. They go, the Allies go north and hold the south and they leave very little in the center and that little gets faced with the Schwerpunkt of the German army. Now, as I talked about in a previous episode about logistics, the Germans barely, barely make it to the French coast. You know, they barely make it to the channel. And it's touch and go even then. And the logistics are overstretched. Uh, one source, I believe it might be Jackson again, said that it was in, uh, in the tail end of this offensive, they had like basically a huge... Uh, traffic jam, and I think he calls it the largest traffic jam of the uh, in the history of the world so far. You know, in uh, in like Luxembourg area, because they were trying to send that many divisions in one little area, and it got really chaotic for them. So the Germans are barely able to do what they need to do. Guderian rides on ahead, and so does Rommel, and 
you know, this has got the whole, well, the infantry can't catch up, so we stop them, but then Guderian offers his resignation, they keep on going, blah, blah, blah. But the whole point is that, yes, the Germans are, they, they you know, they don't have a particularly, it, they have an easy campaign, but it's it, it doesn't go as smoothly as we would think. So a concentrated counterattack would have actually been pretty sufficient, and de Gaulle and several others, you know, try this. The British also try to counterattack, but unfortunately, they just, you know, Maginot Line, they're in the north. They they don't have enough time to send the troops down south when they by the time they realize that what's going on. And in fact, so the within five days of the campaign getting underway, Churchill gets a phone call. I can't remember the French guy's name, one of the leadership of the French going, We've already lost, right? Within five days, Churchill's being informed, we've already lost. Uh, and that's that's how bad it is because they realized that once the the Germans break through Sedan at Sedan, there's nothing to plug the line. There's nothing to plug the gap. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, well, okay, some of the French divisions do retreat, but there's only a handful of French divisions. They're not very well equipped. They're facing the best that the Germans have got. Can you really blame them for that? Not really. Now, the French do have several tank divisions uh, of two different types, but I'm not going to get into that. They do try and counterattack, but even when you look at this, like, yeah, okay, the French have more tanks than the Germans. So with the British as well, that's quite a lot. But each French tank division only has 160 tanks, approximately. The Germans have well over 200. So even if they went toe to toe, the French are at a disadvantage. Yes, the French have got better tanks, quote unquote, better tanks like the Shah Bs, uh, and the medium tanks are pretty good as well, supposedly, compared to like a Panzer II or three, maybe, um, or the Czech tanks. So arguably, you know, they're better armored and got maybe better guns or similar guns or whatever. And it's like, okay, that's fair enough. But again, they're outnumbered. When you actually look at it, yeah, on paper it looks pretty good, but the French tanks are also. Like the Shah Bs, I believe, are one man turreted. Like, no, that even two man turrets are pretty horrible to work. You know, to get to work, you actually really need at least three men turrets, and the French don't have that. So that's a disaster. They got one, uh, one man turret, and actually, um, one source says that the as a result of this, the German tanks could fire three to five, three to four times faster than the. Um, than the French tanks because the guy, the lonely guy in the turret, the tank is there reloading his gun very, very slowly, whereas the Germans have got two or three guys in the turret of their tanks reloading. So they can actually fire much faster. So really, even these French divisions can't go, you know, the best of the French divisions, the best uh, tank divisions you've got, can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Panzer division. Uh, although they do pretty well when they do counterattack. They, they actually, there's um, a battle, the first tank battle, uh, well, first tank, first proper tank battle between divisional sized units, which happens, I believe, in Belgium and is called Hanot, the Battle of Hanot. Yeah, it takes place over two day period, 12th to the 14th of May. It's two DLMs and two Panzer divisions. And it's technically not the first tank battle or tank versus tank action, but I believe it is. It could be the first tank battle ever, or at least the first with Panzer and obviously tank divisions. Uh, the Germans lost 165 tanks in this battle, while the French lost 105. So despite the disadvantages or the advantage, the, you know, the French can actually do pretty well when they get into combat. But the problem is that the Battle of Hanot is in the north, not in the center. And it is just a case of the Manstein sickle cut, the other way around for you guys, it's, it's just, it places the Germans in the right area against the weakest divisions that the French have got to offer, slices through, gets to the coast, encircles, you know, arguably some of the best units that the British and the French have got. And that's it. That's all it does. It, this isn't a tactical thing. This isn't necessarily a morale thing. Um, it's not moral decay. It's nothing like that. And it isn't like... Oh yeah, there was hundreds and thousands of French fleeing. Yeah, like the civilians did, but there isn't that many. There's only eighteen or so divisions in in the area that you know get 
hit by the Germans fair point. So there can't be that many troops fleeing. And it only turns out there is only a handful of, of French divisions that do flee, and these are all reserve units. So it's nothing to do, re well, it, you know, there's part of it, but it's not a lot to do. It's not the only factor that there's this moral decay in the Third Republic. Like one of the authors was saying, yes, there's uh, between 1920 and 1939, there was like something stupid like 40 different governments of in France. You know, they were having governments all over the place. It's like, well, clearly that shows that there was political instability and there was communists and all this. And it's like, yes, that's a factor, but that doesn't explain... Well, I mean, it ha I don't think it has anything to do with it. Yeah, that might explain why those two particular divisions decided to flee, but it doesn't explain why when the French decided to fight, and they actually did pretty well. And even in the Battle of Sedan, it's not as clear-cut as that. The middle German corps gets stuck and can't get across. It takes them, it takes them a couple of days to get across the Meuse. Um, the, the French divisions there actually hold on. They then get defeated because there's over, they're overwhelmed. Um, and that's when you know the, the Germans strike off. But it's like, yeah, when the French actually decide to hold their ground, they actually do pretty well. Um, so it isn't just a case of, oh yes, they, they fled and that was it. No, there's plenty of evidence that goes against this. And it is actually a case of, I think it's battle tactics. And it doesn't matter how good your troops are. If you go marching off into Belgium and the main battles at the Ardennes or the Ardennes area or the area going towards the coast, then it doesn't really matter where you're, you know, what, how good your troops are. You're going to get surrounded. And that once you're surrounded, that's it. So that's how I'd look at it. So, yeah, a couple of divisions did flee, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't look past that. I wouldn't think that's how you know all the French are cowardly. That doesn't make any sense to me. And then it comes down to was the British and French plan bad, and is that the fault of the generals? And this was touched upon about one of the questions about Gamelin or however you say his name, and also, um, yeah, so. There is a lot to be said about the French generals and the British generals. Were they very good? Were they really bad at this stage? And the, some of the authors, again, are like, well, you know, pointing the blame. Oh, it's all their fault. And I believe there was trials going on during the war in Vichy, France, who were, you know, trying to blame these generals. Now, it is true that some of these generals were pretty poor. And... There is the whole, what is the French doctrine and how did they try and implement it? And is this the fault of the general? So there's a lot to go into here, but basically the French have a doctrine called methodical battle. Arguably, they didn't have a chance to put this into practice because there was only a handful of divisions facing the Germans' rare point. So, yeah, it's hard to really say if this was really a thing, but the idea of the methodical battle was kind of what the, the British think as well and they they basically think, well, the generals should be 50 miles behind the front line. And I'm not joking, though. there's actually one general where I believe they were 48 kilometers behind the line. So, yeah, the French generals are behind the line. The men go to the fight, but the whole thing is like, well, we're going to plan it out. We're going to, you know, bring up our artillery. We'll, we'll, we'll do it step by step, kind of like a, the First World War battle. And this doesn't compute when you get to... Blitzkrieg or Bewegungskrieg, like the, the war movement with the Germans, they, they, it just doesn't compute. And yeah, they get outmaneuvered and crushed. Uh, there's communication issues because Gamelin himself doesn't actually have a radio at his headquarters, nor does he have pigeons, apparently. So he is completely isolated and he has to rely on runners, which you can, like, think that how how are you met you're the main guy you're the main guy of the french army and you're relying on runners to actually get your messages out like what um and by the sounds of it this guy doesn't make many decisions anyway so maybe he didn't need a radio but it's basically like this guy's out of touch with reality is it really his fault though uh, one of the guys coming to his defense says well okay he might not perform so well on the day of battle or not, we're not sure, but he actually was the one who set up the, the army in its first place and developed it all and got it to where it was. So you can't really blame him too much. He was a good general, he just got overwhelmed. I, I can't really say you can pin the blame on the French generals either, to be fair, because 
yeah, the, the plan was to go into Belgium. That was the main flaw of the plan. So... I, who's blame? You know, okay, maybe it's the French general, maybe it's the British general. Like, who do you blame at that point? The Allies just got outmaneuvered. That's that's how it is. And for me, I would say that was more the Germans got it right than the Allies got it wrong. Um, but I don't know. So there's bad communication systems going on. The French generals, uh, even down to divisional level, aren't so great. Um, but again, I'm talking about the divisions at Sedan, really, not really anywhere else. So uh, the 55th Division, the one that fled first, the reason it starts to flee is not only has it been hit by Stukas, which terrified the troops, but also the general in charge of it decided to re, you know, move his HQ. And as a result, he lost contact with the troops. The troops then got scared and didn't know what to do. They were receiving no orders and took matters into their own hands. And that's why they started fleeing. And I believe the second division, the um, 71st, that commander might have been the one so many miles behind the front line. So he was out of touch with reality. Apparently the, the artillery from the Germans and the uh, Stukas and the bombers completely wiped out the telephone system in the area. So... It just basically, communications broke down, units didn't know where units were, and it just, the whole thing just disintegrated. So, yeah. How much is it fault with the generals? Well, uh, it, again, it really depends on your perspective on this. I, I honestly think that, yeah, they're partly to blame, but in reality, it is the, just the operation. Like, if, if, the British and the French best troops going into Belgium had actually not gone to Belgium, but gone to the Ardennes area, then you would have had a decent battle. Then you would have seen a different outcome to the war, I think. So it is, I, I honestly think it's more of a case of, yeah, the French generals aren't maybe that good. Neither the British generals. Um, Montgomery's in there as well, which we'll get to in a minute. And... Yeah, you can kind of blame some of the troops, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is it comes down to the operational part here. The the British and the French just have the wrong plan. And the, the Germans have the right plan. And they were very lucky, um, very lucky. Because if the French or the British have actually bothered to have a reserve, which they don't seem to have done, and they could have plugged the gap or just gained enough time to move their forces south or whatever... It could have been a completely different campaign. It is worth noting that a lot of the French civilians did flee. So whether Rommel's account or whatever are exaggerated and going, oh, look at all the French troops retreating, when in fact it was civilians or not, I'd have to really go into it to actually see that. But uh, one of the accounts actually says some of the cities were completely like, the, you know, let's say there's 100,000 people in the city 80,000 of them might flee. You know, there was a lot of people fleeing and it's a mass, they, they, they actually call it an exodus because uh, that's probably the best way to describe it. There's a lot of people fleeing away. This gets in the way of the troops and slows down the, the allied units. It clearly slows down the, the German units as well. So can we say that, okay, maybe, maybe the allied, uh, sorry, the German units thought that some of these units were you know, enemy troops or whatever, you know, because there's no doubt that some of the troops were got mixed into it. Yeah, maybe that was the case, but the reality, the reality was once the Germans got through Sudan, there was a couple of counterattacks on the flanks, but not a lot stood in their way. And those counterattacks were kind of meh. Like, oh, look, there's one tank division. It's like, really? One tank division versus, like, de Gaulle, you know, sends his troops in, it's like one division is not going to do a lot, so you can't really, you can't really say yeah the Germans faced that much opposition. The reality was they just encircled the enemy. So Timo has said you mentioned a few times that you're working your way through the African theater of war to give a well based view on the fame of Montgomery as a military leader. However, he was a military leader already in the British Expeditionary Force, and seems to have taken a few of his subordinates with him on his rise through the ranks. Have you considered doing a video on that part of his involvement in World War II? 
if I was to do this, I would have to do like a wider Battlestorm, um, Battle of France sort of thing, because it's kind of in isolation, it wouldn't make much sense. Uh, it's true that Montgomery, um, so at the beginning, this is going to sound vague because there's no way, unless I put it on a map, it's kind of hard to explain. So when the British decide, okay, we're going into Belgium now, Montgomery's core actually, or, or units division, I, I, I think, there you go, mine's gone blank. Uh, whatever unit Mon Montgomery is actually leading, he takes his, his time. He doesn't just go. Uh, he's actually, I think he only leaves in the afternoon, whereas everyone else leaves in the morning. So he's actually one of the slowest to get going. And this was what, uh, I can't remember his name, for, for somebody, Case Red, whatever, whoever wrote Case Red. Um, he, you know, he's critical. Oh, look, Montgomery didn't move. And it's, it's like, yeah. Um, and then Montgomery, when the, they, they get encircled, Montgomery then apparently he moves his forces into a certain area to, to block off the German advance coming in through Belgium. And it's seen as, oh, look, he's done really well. If only, if Montgomery hadn't have done that, then he would have lost the campaign. But these are only minor things. They're not, they're, it's not like, you know, Montgomery saved the day. Um, I don't think anyway. It's like, yeah, he plugged the gap. Congratulations. Um, and he was only a junior, I say junior, he was only a mid-tier commander at this stage. I don't think he's really got that much going for him. And I've just summed it up in, what, three minutes, what he probably did. So yeah, he does have some impact on this, but it's like, it's only really exclusive to this campaign. I wouldn't really say it really impacts what happens later, and it's not that major anyway. Plus... This is in 1940, you know, May, June, 1940. The next time we see Montgomery is, I'm not even sure, the month, August of 1942. Now that's two years later. So there's no, there's a gap. You know, I don't think it's necessary. And part of the reason why I wanted to do the North African campaign was to see how Montgomery compared to the, the generals that came before him. And then how does he compare to the Americans later on. If we compare Montgomery to the generals in 1940, because this is the thing, because whoever wrote Case Red for, for whatever his name is, he goes some way to try and blame the British for the, for the disaster that was 1940. It's like, I mean, I'm reading his arguments. And I'm like, look, even I could counterattack these. And I don't know a lot on the, on the French campaign, if I'm honest, but even I, even I could do a, a good job of defending against this guy. It's like, yes, the British didn't bring enough planes. It's like, well, neither did the French. Like, it just, like, none of his arguments make any sense to me. It's like, that doesn't make, like, and if you look at the reviews of the book online, people, a lot of people are going, why is he blaming the British? It's nothing to do. It was just an operational defeat. If you brought, the thing is as well, so let me just say about Dunkirk. The, I forget how many French troops flee from Dunkirk, but it's a, it's a lot. Um, yeah, so if you look at Dunkirk, so there's uh, 198,000 British and 139,000 mostly French troops get evacuated. And then there's another thirty to 40,000 French troops who stay behind to hold the the um, encirclement to prevent the Germans from getting in. So you've got a lot of French troops in the north. This This is the point that I make it's like if you blame the British, then you kind of blame the French as well because the French have got just as many troops in the area. So it's like, why is he, why is this guy, oh, it was the whole campaign is the British fault. Like, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't, no. I mean, the, I'm sure the British did things wrong. Absolutely, they did. Um, and I'm sure Montgomery didn't save the day, but you can't really, you can't blame the British for the entire campaign. That doesn't make any sense. That's like, oh, yeah, actually, it wasn't the French's fault. It's the, like, no, stop it. Um, and yeah, if you want to read a very interesting book, Case Red, um, I think it's controversial is probably the way. I like, you know, I like controversial books, but I think it goes a little bit too far with it. Um, but the point is that I don't think the British really could have done much different. They would, they went north with the French troops uh, and the battle was in the center and... They just, they just, that was it. They just got outflanked. That's all it is. 
That's all it is. And it wouldn't have mattered who was in the north and who was in the south or whatever. The point is there wasn't any, and there wasn't enough troops in the Ardennes area. So I don't really, I mean, Montgomery's actions at Dunkirk or whatever, it's not really relevant to what happens later. So I don't see why, I don't, I don't think I can sum it up. I don't think there's a reason why that is, would be relevant to what happened at El Alamein more than giving a sort of brief overview, which I've just done. So yeah. And, and the gap of two years is also kind of a factor in that as well. Plus I'd have to do the entire battle of France, which would take forever. So I'm not doing that uh, just yet, but uh yeah, that's, that's actually the reason why. Alexandra asked a question for a much broader topic, perhaps. What, in your opinion, were the key phases of the learning curve for the English military and government from 1939 on? I remember reading that Auchinleck was very critical of Operation Sickle and the subservience of the British command to amateur politicians. Okay, so you asked this question a long time ago. And I, I've kind of dilly dallied and not, I've, I've had to think about it because it's actually quite, it's such a broad question. It is actually incredibly hard to answer. And I don't think there's a book that I can just buy off the shelf and go, what is the key, key English general, you know, learning curve? Like the, I don't think the one exists. Um, the problem with this question is that it relies on a lot of factors and there's no way I can read into all of it in one go in order to get this question right. So this is going to be a little bit vague. Um, so I apologize in advance, but I have done some thinking. So let's start in 1939. First off, and this actually happens before the war, you have the molotov ribbentrop Pact. This is actually really significant for the British and the French and whatever else, and the Polish especially, because suddenly you've got an alliance or a potential alliance between Germany and the Soviet Union. Uh-oh, what's going on? Now, you have the Battle of France, you have the Battle of Britain, and, you know, basically a period of two or three years where you're kind of like, are the Germans and Soviets working together? And you actually have an operation being planned by the British to actually bomb the Caucasus oil fields and probably other operations as well. Uh, and so in Britain's time of going alone from 19, mid-1940 onwards, you've got this sort of unanswered question of what's happening with the Soviets. And if the Soviets had allied with the, the Germans, ooh, that would have been bad for the British because they were stretched enough as it was, especially in 1940. So that's actually a major big deal. So I actually think that one of the learning curves is... Well, this sort of period of going, huh, maybe, maybe the Soviets aren't allied with the Germans. Uh, what, at what time did they realize this? I'm not entirely certain. They do seem to be giving warnings to Stalin in 1941 saying, hey, the Germans are about to attack you. And he just ignores them. So they kind of know probably in 1941 that uh, something's up. But up until that point, it's like, uh oh. Um, so I think of one of the big learning curves for the British military and government is to go, oh, oh good, the, the, the Germans and the Soviets are not together and the Soviets aren't going to attack us. I think that's a, a big one. Uh, obviously, you get the fall of Poland. Um, Churchill taking power, or to, taking over and replacing Chamberlain is a turning point and a learning curve. Um, but it's not really relevant to the military, but that in terms of the government, that is actually quite important because, and it, and it's not as clear cut as his, the history books make it out to be. When he delivered his famous, um, we'll fight them on the beaches. Oh no, was it that one? Yeah, it's far finest hour. When he delivers that, it turns out that the Labour government in Britain was actually the ones who were supporting him the most, which is bizarre since the Labour government didn't want to go to law and to war, but who knows? Um, and the Conservative government weren't really that interested in him. He, like, it was a toss-up between him and Lord Acton, something like that. Uh, and it turns out that Churchill won and blah, blah, blah. And eventually everyone came around to it. But yeah, no, it, it was kind of like touch and go whether Churchill would have even stayed. Uh, and a lot of people didn't like him. So there's that going on. Um, the fall of France, that then leads to 
Britain going alone. You mentioned Operation Sickle, which is how Churchill gets into power because Operation Sickle in Norway, it was Norway, um, that campaign was a disaster and it was also Churchill's doing, but Chamberlain gets the blame for it. <laughs> and then Churchill takes over, it's like, Wow, so Churchill messed up, Chamberlain gets the fall, and then Churchill gets promoted, essentially, to Prime Minister. It's kind of weird. Um, and yeah, Orkin, I think there's a lot of people critical of Operation Sickle. One thing to note, though, so in this period when Britain goes alone, so mid-1940 onwards, the British strategy is to win in the Atlantic, win in the air, and the peripheries, so the edges or the... The Brit Britain, the British know that they can't really land a force in France and go toe to toe with the Germans. The British military was never designed to do that. Britain is an island nation; it's mainly designed to fight in the sea. At uh, this at uh, this time, Royal Navy rules the waves or whatever, and the air. So that's really where the British are concentrating. So they only got a small navy. Okay, so and this is another argument of the fall of France. Like, oh, the British should have sent lots more troops. It's like. That's not what they would... No, the, the British were trying to blockade Germany, which forced thing the Germans to go east. In the first. Anyway, so yeah, that's not really an, an argument because the point of the British is to provide the Navy and maybe the Air Force, not the military might. Um, although that's important as well. So in this period of 40 to 41, 42, Britain's fighting on the periphery. So... Churchill thinks Norway is a good way to attack the Germans, which it probably is because you can't go south in 1940 area because Italy and the Balk uh, yeah the Balkans aren't really involved. So you've got to go north or through the middle and the phony war's on. So going north into Norway could potentially cut off or bring Sweden into the war and get them on their side or prevent them from delivering supplies to Germany, which is why Hitler's so obsessed with it. And this is the point actually as well. So yeah, okay, you might be critical of Operation Sickle. You might be critical of the whole Norwegian campaign. Hitler himself though is adamant that uh, Norway and the Scandinavia in general are essential to his victory of the war. As late as the Battle of Kurland, etc. Hitler is obsessed with this idea of holding on to Norway. That's why he keeps so many troops in Norway as possible, because he thinks that the, the, the key to the war is the North. Probably could do an entire episode on that, but yeah. So Churchill kind of recognizes this as well. Uh, later on, this whole Norway thing didn't work out. So they then decide to go to the South in North Africa and other areas as well, but the Britain always seems to be fighting on the periphery because they don't have a major, massive army. Um, they only have like two armies at any point in the war which are fighting the Germans, so you can't really, I, you can't really blame, it's like imagine a small army going up against the entire three million German Wehrmacht, it's got no, they've got no chance. So Britain always is trying to fight on the edges so you have the Battle of the Atlantic, that kind of lasts, well, the turning point is like 42, 43, so that's quite a way, so that's a learning curve, it's like, oh, we're actually going to survive this, Battle of Britain, we're obviously going to survive this, so really this period of Britain goes alone, what Churchill's trying to do is, is nip at the Germans from all directions and try and get as many allies as possible, which is why Churchill's so obsessed about helping out Greece, so obsessed about taking out uh, Iran and Iraq, uh, sorting out East Africa, um, obviously fighting the Far East, which I won't get into, and also showing Roosevelt, hey, look, not only are we surviving, because that was the thing about the Battle of Britain, Roosevelt was like, we don't, are they, are, are, is Britain going to survive? Roosevelt. Roosevelt was saying, is Britain going to survive? Uh, and that was up to the debate. And it, it turns out the Battle of Britain kind of proves to the um, Americans, yes, actually, Britain is going to survive. So, hey. Um, Battle of Atlantic's going on. That's again, we, they can't lose that because that will destroy Britain's supply routes. So it is a case of we're trying to fight on on the periphery. And Norway's a thing, Africa's a thing. <clears throat> um, fighting in the navy and the air force is a thing. So that's kind of the strategy until the Americans come along and until Torch comes along. 
And at that point, it's then a case of Churchill is still interested in going on the periphery. You know, notice, you know, I talked about this in the Battle of Anzio video. Churchill's still obsessed about going through Italy because he wants to fight the Germans and on the edges, you know, on the periphery. He's not interested about directly engaging them unless they're completely ready to do so. And he's even thinking about going through the Balkans and Greece again, etc., which they'd later do in the war. And, and Churchill's always got this, we'll fight them from the edges. But that, I think, is just because that's the way the British kind of fight. Um, they, they don't have a big enough military to really just land and go for it. Um, unlike the Americans or the Soviets, let's say. So really, they're just kind of waiting for the, the Americans to come along to help them actually land it. Whereas, you know, I think Britain's strategy was hold on um, because they could blockade Germany, which... That was another thing about the Battle of France as well. The whole point of the phony war and whatever else was to kind of delay and cause the Germans economic damage because they knew that it worked in the First World War. So, of course, it would work in the Second World War, which it pretty much did because the Germans didn't have enough oil or food. So the whole point was to delay the Germans enough from winning in order for the British blockade to strangle the Germans, which in reality, that's exactly what happened. So this is why it was Britain holding on at the Battle of the Atlantic. Was that the turning point of the war? Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to comment on that yet. But that, I guess the, the, the learning curve is, okay, we're going alone. We're going to fight them on the peripheries. Oh, good. The Americans have come along. Oh, we can still fight them on the peripheries. And now we've landed in Normandy. Let's go and win. And I think, yeah, a little bit vague, but I I, uh, I think that's probably the best way I can really explain that because I'd have, to, I'd have to go into a lot of different books in order to get a proper big perspective of that. Um, but that's also why Britain's interested in commandos and paratroopers and, you know, Bruneville Raid. They're interested in nipping and, and the spy war and, and all that sort of stuff because Britain knows that they can't just get an army and just throw it at Normandy. They haven't got the troops to do that. So Dieppe Raid, uh, that's another one. Uh, and lots of raids in North Africa and the Long Range Desert Group. They're all about just nipping because the British military is small. Well, the British army is small. The Navy and the Air Force are kind of big, but the army itself is small. So that's kind of that. Um, but that, yeah, I guess that I, that does answer the question, I think. So, yeah. So, yeah, that was my rambling answer. Uh, I hope I answered the questions. I think it did. Sorry about my voice. Hope you enjoyed the video. And thank you for supporting if you do. Bye for now.